Thank you all for joining us today to discuss some important and serious uh, information about the city's long-term uh, fiscal challenges. As many of you know, I came into office just three years ago and immediately confronted the largest annual budget deficit in the city's modern history. At the same time, the city also faced a major pension crisis that threatened the fire and police pension system. We acted, we acted decisively. We acted decisively to address the annual fiscal deficit as well as the pension crisis, saving the city from an acute budget calamity. Each year since then, as a result of economic pressures, rising costs, and slow-growing revenues, the city has continued to face significant budget shortfalls. In total, in just over the past three years, the city has eliminated nearly $300 million in budget shortfalls primarily through spending reductions, all while keeping the core city services such as police, fire, and sanitation funded. The global economic crisis exposed financial vulnerabilities at all levels of government. We've discussed that before. Some have called this the new normal. In the city's case, it re-exposed a serious structural imbalance between revenues and expenses that had been masked by the housing bubble. And it showed the great need for better, longer-term budget planning. That's why a year ago I called for the creation of the city's uh, first 10-year financial plan so that we can do more to address the challenges uh, that face us in, in a lasting and comprehensive way rather than just budgeting year to year. The first part of this effort is to fully understand the true scope of the city's long-term financial challenges with a 10-year financial forecast. Beginning in September 2011, the city engaged a national consulting firm experienced in public sector long-term financial plans, Public Financial Management, Inc., or PFM, to develop the city's 10-year fiscal forecast. I'd like to recognize Mr. Nadal from PFM and Mr. Harry Black, our finance director, the team uh, that worked together on this important project. You've probably logged in more hours together than you'd like to. He's giving me that sly smirk like, yes, you know we've logged in more hours than we'd like to, but uh, I think it's worth it. It's important work. Past PFM engagements included successful long-range plans developed with Philadelphia, uh, with Pittsburgh, and, uh, and we didn't hold that against you, as well as uh, D.C. Uh, they've been, PFM has been linked to strategies for governments under external oversight boards and facing immediate fiscal distress. In Baltimore, our effort is different. It is a proactive approach to help the city better head off underlying structural budget pressures. Again, the first step towards addressing the problem is to, be, is to uh, have a complete and full understanding of the problem itself. So today, I'm going to briefly outline all the major findings of the city's first 10-year financial plan or, excuse me, our forecast, then turn it over to our budget director, Mr. Andrew Klein, to provide some additional details. This is important information everyone with a stake in Baltimore's future should pay attention to. So let's start with the uh, structural operating deficit. First, the city, go the city government faces a serious structural imbalance between slow-growing revenues and faster-growing expenses. Again, you know, it seems we've dealt with this. We understand this. This is not new. Under the mainstream set of economic assumptions, uh, PFM projects a fiscal gap of approximately $30 million in this fiscal year, growing to nearly $125 million by uh, 20, the fiscal year 2022. Without corrective action over the next nine years, a cumulative shortfall would uh, total nearly $750 million. Second. City government agencies face a $1 billion general fund infrastructure deficit over the next decade. Investment in the renewal and replacement of basic city infrastructure, roads, bridges, and cities buildings, including the, uh, police and fire stations, as well as maintenance of our facilities, now falls short of levels required just to maintain the current uh, state of repair. Again, this is something we all know. All you have to do is ride on our elevators, and you know that uh, we have some infrastructure uh, issues. Third, city government has an aggregate underfunding, underfunded retirement 
retiree liability of more than $3 billion, including the actuarial shortfalls, the city's retirement systems and non-pension, other post-employee benefits, employment benefits. The city must take a more meaningful uh, approach to reduce its unfunded retiree liabilities. Finally, Baltimore's high overall tax burden, especially the property tax rate, falls disproportionately on city residents and businesses, further impeding the city's ability to compete for growth. Baltimore cannot simply hike property tax rates to improve its long-term uh, financial situation. Such property tax increases would only further erode the city's population, its tax base, and the overall economy over time. Instead, we need to find ways to reduce the property tax burden at the same time we maintain critical city services and address the, the structural deficit. It's a tough undertaking, but I believe more can be done. This 10-year fiscal forecast makes, makes clear that the city government must implement serious fiscal reforms in order to balance the budget, protect city, service, protect city services from major cuts, invest in infrastructure, and reduce the property tax burden for city residents over the next decade. A status quo approach we know is unsustainable. Taking on the, these challenges will be critical both for the health of the city's finances and to help Baltimore compete for growth over the next 10 years and beyond. We cannot get Baltimore growing again without, strong, uh, without a strong fiscal foundation, and this effort will support our goal of growing Baltimore by 10,000 families over the next decade. We are being proactive, identifying the problem and seeking to address it before it's too late for us to make our own choices. In the coming days and weeks, starting with the State of the City Address on Monday, I plan to propose a bold set of major reforms to address the fiscal challenges outlined in the 10-year forecast. The reforms will focus on eliminating the deficit, making modern investments, and changing the city's tax structure to make Baltimore more competitive for growth. But before proposing anything like this, we need to understand, all of us need to understand the full scope of the problem, and that's why that's what we are doing, outlining the forecast today. With that, let me turn uh, the podium over to our budget director, Mr. Andrew Klein, for a detailed presentation of the budget forecast. Andrew? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good morning. Before I uh, delve into the, the fiscal forecast, just want to recap the last few years, uh, what we've gone through uh, from a fiscal perspective in the city. Uh, as, as the mayor mentioned, just in the last three years, uh, we've closed uh, nearly 300 million in cumulative budget deficits. Um, city's been grappling with the recession and, and its aftermath for, for five years now. Um, we have taken steps, uh, both sustainable and unsustainable, to balance these budgets. Um, we have reformed the fire and police pension system. Um, that avoided a, a nearly $80 million increase in, in our pension contributions. Uh, we also, over the last three years, and particularly uh, for, for 2013, reformed our retiree and active employee health benefit programs. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, health benefit reforms that, that took effect January 1st of this year were really the, the sort of down payment on this 10-year plan that we'll be rolling out. Uh, and those alone will be saving us nearly $20 million a year, and, and that's already built into the, the baseline projections I'll be, I'll be talking about. Uh, but we've done a lot of things that are, are not sustainable. We've, we've, we had a hiring freeze for several years. We froze wages in, in, in most years of this plan, of, of these uh, uh, last five. We, uh, we furloughed employees. Uh, and we've also had to make um, decisions like deferring a lot of capital investment, reducing our, our uh, infrastructure investment. And, and services have been impacted uh, from closing fire companies, uh, closing recreation centers, <clears throat> reducing library hours, um, reducing tree maintenance, um, art and culture, uh, programs and a, and a whole range of others. In addition to that, uh, with the fiscal 2011 budget, we put through a $50 million package of, of revenue enhancements. We brought the income tax to the maximum allowed by the state. 
Uh, we created the beverage container tax. Uh, we increased the uh, parking, energy, hotel, telephone taxes, uh, and, and others. Uh, so most of our response has been to reduce spending, uh, but we've also increased uh, revenue. Uh, and, and, and now we're at a point where, um, you know, looking forward, we still face major challenges. So the, the, the first phase of our 10-year plan effort was to get a handle on uh, what are the next 10 years going to look like from a fiscal perspective. And the bottom line, um, in terms of expected revenues compared to the cost of maintaining the current level of city services, uh, which has already been eroded uh, over the past several years, is a cumulative shortfall of, of $745 million. Um, starting with 30.3 million in fiscal 14, um, annual deficits growing to 125 million by 2022. Uh, and again, this is if we do nothing. Uh, and, and that's, of course, not an option. Uh, even if we were to uh, turn to our reserves, which we have, we have avoided doing um, these last five years, if we turn to our reserves as a solution, they wouldn't even last three years before they'd be exhausted. We looked at more than one economic scenario for this plan. We, we looked at three. Um, the, the, the baseline projection I just talked about uh, was predicated on the middle scenario. And that middle scenario assumes a steady but modestly paced economic recovery, employment levels gradually improving, city population stabilizing, um, we're not assuming uh, significant population growth in the baseline, it's just stable population. Uh, housing market stabilizing with some moderate growth um, as we go forward, um, supported by continued low interest rates. Um, moderate growth in our income tax and other economically sensitive revenues. Uh, ongoing incremental gains in uh, public school enrollment consistent with recent trends. Uh, pension costs meeting the current actuarial assumptions and moderate health care inflation relative to, to recent years, um, about 6% in uh, fiscal 14 and, and then and moderating from, from there. So that, that was our baseline set of assumptions. We also looked at an optimistic and a pessimistic set of assumptions. Um, in the optimistic assumptions, uh, you know, we're assuming that you know, health care costs uh, moderate somewhat, um, uh, faster growth in employment and, and uh, faster recovery of the housing market. Um, but even with that set of assumptions, we still face deficits in every year of the plan, totaling $325 million over the life of the plan. Um, then the pessimistic scenario, um, we, don't, we don't think this is a worst case scenario. Um, it assumes you know, a short, shallow recession in the near term with slow recovery going forward. Um, pensions not quite meeting their actuarial assumptions, uh, health care costs being um, uh, fa higher uh, than expected in the baseline uh, set of assumptions. And under that scenario, we're looking at a $1.3 billion cumulative shortfall with annual deficits growing to $270 million um, in, the, in the last year of the 10-year of the period that we looked at. Um, we think it's, it would be clearly irresponsible to base a 10-year plan on the optimistic scenarios. There, there are just too many uncertainties, um, uh, too many risks that are out there. Um, but we also don't think it makes sense to, to use a, a pessimistic scenario, even though it's not worst case. Um, so we're, we're, we're comfortable that um, using the mainstream set of assumptions, uh, that's a sound basis for, uh, for a projection and for developing a plan. So what's driving the, the shortfalls? Uh, first, first of all, uh, as I said, slow economic recovery. Um, you know, every, every uh, mainstream uh, forecaster indicates, you know, we're not, we don't expect a rebound back to where we were uh, during the housing bubble. Um, it's going to be slow and steady. 
Uh, we also we rely heavily on, on property taxes. They, they make up 50% of our general fund revenue. And in Maryland, uh, assessment increases are phased in over three years, meaning that even as the housing market does start to recover, it's going to take time before the city sees the, the full revenue from that recovery. Um, so that plays, a, that plays a role in our, in our projections as well. Um, we've just, fiscal 14 is the fourth consecutive year of, of assessment decline for the city. Our property tax revenues have been dropping and, and we expect will continue to fall um, before starting to, to, to recover in uh, fiscal 15 or 16. Another big factor on the revenue side is that our, our, our tax burden is, is too large. I'll talk some more about that. Um, but we don't have competitive uh, tax structure. And, and fourth, we've seen declining state and federal assistance um, with risk, particularly on the federal side. Um, we rely heavily on, on state and federal assistance. Um, the state has shifted a lot of funding away from us, particularly in the, the transportation area. They've also shifted costs to us, teacher pension costs, sheriff pension costs, um, other costs. Um, so you know, those remain concerns. On the expenditure side, employee health care and pension costs continue to grow rapidly. Um, the cost of uh, employee compensation and retiree benefits make up 60% of the general fund budget. So you know, any plan has to focus uh, uh, quite significantly on those, those workforce costs. Uh, and a lot of the rest of the general fund budget outside of that is fixed. It, uh, debt service and the maintenance of effort payments to the city schools uh, being the largest pieces. The aging infrastructure uh, puts continual pressure on the budget. Um, as infrastructure is neglected, it fails. Um, and, and then you get surprises, um, like the Monument Street sinkhole. Uh, that's costing almost $8 million to repair, and probably half of that cost is going to fall on the general fund. And finally, uh, the mayor mentioned, the, as of the most recent valuations, uh, our unfunded liabilities for pension and retiree health care total more than $3 billion. So looking more closely at some of these expenditure pressures, uh, this chart shows that from fiscal 2007 through 2012, revenue grew by 3%. Um, and that's not an annual growth. That's, a, that's the growth for that entire period, including the tax increases I talked about. Uh, at the same time, wages and benefits for active uh, and retired employees grew by nearly 12%. And within that 12% growth, we had 21% uh, growth in active employee health care costs and nearly 90% growth in our pension contributions. This slide is a, a summary of the, the major revenue and, and cost drivers. Uh, bottom line is these middle two bars in the box. Um, we're projecting that revenue will grow by 1.9% a year on average in this 10-year period, um, but expenditures uh, will grow by 2.7%. And that difference just compounds year by year uh, and creates the large shortfalls that we're talking about. And that, that's just the operating shortfall. Um, each year when we do the budget, we often talk about that operating shortfall. Um, you know, here's what we're facing, here's what we had to close, we have to balance our budget. Um, what we don't often talk about is the infrastructure deficit, the capital spending deficit. So, we focused a lot in, in this planning process on determining you know, what, what, what are the costs for uh, reasonable infrastructure investment. And by reasonable, we meant um, maintaining the current, in a lot of cases, substandard uh, level of infrastructure state of repair and making incremental progress toward a good state of repair. And what we found was, bottom line, um, we are under-investing by uh, more than $100 million a year, and that's just, that's just general fund sources. I'm, I'm not talking about the water and wastewater utility, which has uh, an even larger infrastructure needs over the next 10 years. Um, and and I'm, I'm treating separately for now the, the schools. Um, 
I think it's well known that, that um, we have about two and a half billion dollar price tag on modernizing the schools and the city has made a significant commitment to that and that commitment will be reflected in our 10 year plan. Uh, but we're looking at you know, roads, bridges, public facilities um, outside of those other areas um, and it's a $1.1 billion uh, cumulative gap over the 10 years. Just a couple of examples of this. We have 300 bridges in the city. 21 of those are rated below 50 on the bridge sufficiency index, meaning they are prime candidates for reconstruction or replacement. Uh, in 2008, the last time this was measured, 43% of our roads were found to be in poor state of repair. Uh, we've been resurfacing at a rate of about 200 lane miles a year, which is a big improvement over the past, but with 5,000 total lane miles, it'll take you 25 years to get to all of them. And, you know, roads get beyond resurfacing at a certain point and they need to be reconstructed. So that's just an example of, you know, you neglect the infrastructure and, and, the, and then it just becomes more costly. The, the mayor has a, a plan for uh, rejuvenating our recreation centers, um, uh, having a smaller network of high quality centers, that's going to take investment to expand current centers and build new ones. Um, that will cost on the order of $40 million um, and we need to identify that funding. And we also looked closely at uh, blight removal. Uh, the mayor, through her Vacants to Value program, wants to accelerate blight removal. Um, in the base budget, we only spend $2.3 million a year on demolition. That's barely enough to keep up with emergency needs. Um, so we, we've got to do better there. One of the, this is just to give you an example of why we have such a shortfall. Uh, highway user revenue is uh, money we receive through the state, comes from the state gas tax and vehicle sales tax. We've lost almost $100 million in highway user revenue since 2007. Um, some of that was due to the economy. Most of it was because the state shifted those resources to balance its own budget. We historically used that funding for both capital and operating purposes. When we lost all that revenue, um, unfortunately we had to make the choice to um, take the hit on the capital side. And what we see here is in 2007, we were spending $73 million from, of highway user revenue on capital projects, and that went to zero in 2010, 2011, um, and even today, it, it's only back to $5 million. We looked, we looked at long-term liabilities. So as of the most recent valuations, um, when we add up the unfunded liabilities of our two major pension systems and OPEB, which is other post-employment benefits, meaning retiree health benefits, uh, we're looking at a $3.2 billion unfunded liability. And the reason that the, the OPEB liability is so large is that unlike pensions, Baltimore, like pretty much every other jurisdiction, historically has not pre-funded that benefit. Um, We've all taken the approach of, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll pay the bills when they come due. Um, you know, we, we've determined that that approach today is costing us $55 million more a year than if we had pre-funded this benefit from the beginning. Now that goes back many decades. Um, and it's, you know, it's, all we can do now is look forward. The good news is, um, Pew did a study recently that looked at the 60 largest cities. Uh, Baltimore was in the category uh, with just a handful of other cities of, uh, we have continued to make some contributions over and above just paying each year's bills. Uh, even during the recession and its aftermath, a lot of cities just stopped doing it. Um, they, stopped, they stopped putting the, that funding um, into the system. And also, uh, the. We're going to get the 2012 valuation soon. Um, with the reforms we've made, we do expect to see um, uh, some reduction, some significant reduction in that liability. But it's still going to be um, more than the com combined liability of the of the pension systems. So adding this all up, 745 million um, operating deficit, 
it would cost 125 million over the period to um, to properly fund OPEB and 1.1 billion infrastructure shortfall. Um, so we're looking at a, a two billion dollar shortfall over this over this uh, coming 10 year period. And just a couple of more slides um, to explain why we believe. You know, we can't tax our way out of this problem. Um, it's well known that our property tax rate is more than double any of the surrounding jurisdictions. Um, our income, recordation and transfer, hotel and other taxes are also higher than, uh, than our surrounding counties. This is because we have a weak tax base. Um, the, the, the yield from one penny of property tax is 3.5 million in Baltimore City. That puts us below even Howard County, which has half of our population. So the D State Department of Legislative Services keeps a, a, a tax effort index, uh, and that's a comparison of, of jurisdictions in terms of how much they tax their, their base. Um, Baltimore is, is at 64% above the statewide average. Uh, and far above the next, um, next highest county, which is Allegheny. So the 10-year plan seeks to strengthen the four cornerstones of, of uh, our fiscal foundation, um, achieving structural budget balance, uh, making our taxes more competitive, investing more in our infrastructure, and addressing the long-term liabilities. Um, that concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Sir? What, what is the um, current um, reserves of the city? Uh, our budget stable, stabilization reserve uh, is at $90 million. Okay, thank you. Sure. Plus, the mayor has time for a few questions as well. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just real quick, it seems like this is going to get um, ugly, for lack of a better word, I think. Uh, it seems, are you going to have to cut, because the last time you did this was 120 million, it seemed like there was a big fight from uh, fire and police, things like that, cuts with pensions. Is that is that where this is all leading again? Or maybe, I know you say you're going to address this in the state of the mm -hmm. city, but maybe can you give us a just a broad brush of what? So I think this last happen? slide really gives you the, it doesn't talk about the details, but it gives you where we're headed. You know, we're going to have to, um, you know, balance the, uh, you know, deal with the structural budget uh, imbalance. Um, again, looking for ways that we can uh, use strategies, and, you know, we've used many of them before, but we, we need to continue to do more to, um, as it says, bend the curve and get our city expenditures under control. Um, become more competitive, and that's something that we've worked on, uh, I've worked on with the help of uh, the council before to uh, become more competitive, especially when it comes to property taxes. And I, I'm sure some of my colleagues get tired of me talking about infrastructure investment, but it's important uh, because we are living with uh, the, the result of delaying or pushing, pushing off uh, infrastructure investments. We, we are living with the result of that today. And, you know, we're going to continue to uh, address the long-term liabilities. I started that work uh, as soon as I became, um, you know, one of the, the first things I dealt with uh, when I became mayor is dealing with those long-term liabilities like the fire and police pension. Uh, we've recently done it with health care reform. The, the, the uh, financial forecast tells us that we need to do more and we plan to do more. Mayor, I was going to ask about the tax breaks that have been given to developers for certain economic development. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to reopen some of those deals for pilots and TIFs and get a better uh, return for the city at this point? Because I'm not sure about right. reopening uh, existing deals, but I think it's important and one of the things that we'll talk about is how we can uh, continue to use uh, those incentives uh, to, to, to grow the city in a way that is targeted. Uh, we have some work that we're doing uh, with the with the council right now on the uh, apartment tax uh, credit, and 
we work with uh, the council as well as uh, downtown partnership and, and communities to find ways that we can we could make it a strategy that is outside of uh, that that, it, that while it encompasses the downtown area that we know need those incentives but also looks into the neighborhood which is something that i said that my administration continues to strive to do and we've shown it in with the uh, apartment uh, the uh, tax credit for the um, you know the, the apartment so we're going to continue to do that work and there is a hundred million dollar request at bdc right now for the harbor point project mm -hmm. is that going to get a little more scrutiny with this in mind? all of all of any you know these aren't you know on the back of napkin deals that you know we just get pushed through every tax um, incentive that goes through is examined is examined uh, with an eye on but for uh, would this project happen? And we'll continue to do that on the Harbor Point and any other project that happens, uh, you know, from now moving forward. I mean, we've done it and we'll continue to do it. This plan uh, doesn't assume any population growth, but your goal is to grow 10,000 families. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if that is achieved, if there's significant population growth, would that fix most of these, most of these problems? No, I mean we still need to be. We still need to address the tax competitiveness. I mean, if I achieve my goal of growing the city, that's great. But if I achieve it without handling the rest of this stuff, I, I haven't uh, done what I feel like I need to do as mayor. Have you addressed concerns that um, the size of the city has shrunk? The size of city government has not shrunk. The size of the city itself. Like I think that that's inaccurate. Um, the size of city government has uh, declined dramatically. You're comfortable with you have the numbers on that? I mean, just in the last uh, four years, we've reduced uh, the city of Clement from 15,500 to 14,000. And that's just over the past four years? Yeah. I just remember the studies of the police department that there might have more officers commiserate with the size of the city that they're controlling. And I mean, that's, that was uh, one reporter's uh, estimation. I think if you talk to the community members, they would they would argue with that. That's why they didn't really have much legs. But what, you remember it. Um, given given the deficit and this obvious need for more cuts, what are going to be the biggest uh, targets that you're going to be cutting? Is it, is it even more cuts to the pensions? No, like I said, we're going to talk about solutions. Um, you know, in starting with the state of the city and, and continue uh, with conversations we're going to have in the community. This is about making sure that everybody understands. Uh, you know, not what I say the, the fiscal forecast is for the city, uh, but what financial experts who've taken a look at our city, taken a look at economic trends across the country, where they say we're headed if we don't act. The word that's been out there today has been financial ruin all across the country. People are saying Baltimore's a financial ruin. Um, is that how you would describe this situation? And I, I wouldn't have used I, I wouldn't have used those words, but I mean. You know from our experience, I don't write the headlines, otherwise they'd be a lot different. How do you characterize the state um, I think, you know, it's showing us if, if we fail to act, uh, we'll end up in the same situation that many cities have, where uh, the decisions for our uh, financial future are being made uh, by other, uh, other entities than us. And that's not uh, what I want to see for Baltimore. And I think if we act now, uh, if we act decisively and boldly, we can change the trajectory for the city. The, the term bankruptcy was thrown around. I mean, are, is that even an option that you're looking at down the road? So this is about being proactive so we don't get to that point. Last question, please. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, can I say something? Yeah, why not? Um, I would like to say that um, I, I think that it's an important point. Baltimore City has been has a balanced budget by charter. We have observed those rules. This is a plan going forward. Uh, it's like a family saying, okay, now we better start saving for college. The kids are in kindergarten. You know what I mean? It, this city is not in financial jeopardy. It is not in ruin or bankruptcy. We have a balanced budget. What this is about is a plan to get the kids to college. And basically, and it's and it's all. and it's telling us, in using your same analogy, that if we have kids in kindergarten and we do nothing, then uh, they will graduate from high school and, and not have a college to go, not right. be able to go to college. Right. But that is the level at which 
we are talking today not of some imminent bankruptcy in a city that has distinguished itself, and thanks to this mayor for keeping a balanced budget and avoiding deficit in the midst of this horrendous recession. Thank you. Can I ask about something on a slightly different topic? Uh, well, actually, totally different topic. But the, uh, uh, yesterday there was the stabbing downtown of, of a young boy, and uh, one, one is dead, another one may be in, um, is in critical condition. It happened amid all the great days of Baltimore, and I wanted to hear your thoughts about It's, about it's a tragedy. You know, whether it happened during the parade, as a part of the parade, or it happened you know, in another part of town, uh, a, a young person has lost their life. It's, it is tragic. Um, I'm not uh, satisfied with the rate of uh, violence reduction in the city, and it's something that we continue to strive uh, to improve. Uh, I know that a lot of the work can be done by the police department, but I know that none of it can be done alone. It has to be done in cooperation with our communities, with parents, needs are juveniles. Um, and I'm dedicated to making Baltimore one of the safest big cities in the country. And I, as I re repeat, I won't be satisfied until we're there. Um, that was an unfortunate and grim reminder that there's a lot of work to do. And we continue uh, to, to do that work to improve uh, public safety in all parts of the city.